Uh, episode 604. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the show radio. This episode 604. I'm your host, Andrew. And I'm Danny. And this is your source for tech, gaming, and entertainment news. Head over to theshowradio.info. Once again, that's theshowradio.info. And check out our past shows while you're there. Subscribe and tell a friend about the show. Uh, the show is on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the places that you can find podcasts. We are there. We're also recording this for the uh, Clubhouse folks, as well as the individuals who are going to be on the podcast later on. Uh, so next time that we do do this, we're going to do the replays and see how that works out for this platform so if you are joining us for the first time today uh, definitely check out the club the alliance academy once again that's the alliance academy on clubhouse that's the club and we definitely want to see your faces there as we talk about tech gaming entertainment content uh, on that particular club and you can also join the newsletter on Substack, which is andrew-alliance.com daniela what is going on with you how is your vacay what's happening on your side uh, vacation was good. It was nice. Nice holiday. Um, New Year's was pretty good too. Nothing, nothing crazy. It was small. It was private. Had my sister over. We did some fireworks, but it was pouring here in Hawaii. Um, but it was so good. So I'm just getting back into, you know, the swing of things, feeling things out, recentering myself. That's like the big thing for me for this year is just to get back into, um, doing what I enjoy, things that make me happy, things that I love, and just focusing on the positive. That's dope. Yeah, it was it was a good time. You know, as as you know, we I tend to not uh, talk about like you know my whereabouts and stuff. I, I just live on the internet, but I did have a good time with family. Uh, we enjoyed you know some good food, you know some good wine, and some laughs as well. So it was a good time with family for sure. Uh, hanging out over the holidays, um, got some cool stuff. Got a new microphone for my DSLR, so I'm looking forward to that. Also got a card. Uh, for more space so that's always good uh, for the dslr stuff and uh, also want to mention that uh, i did get a new mic over the holiday excited about this one you know which i'm currently using right now this is the pod mic by road uh, the pod mic so this one is pretty dope and um, also potentially getting a new one this week as well right around my birthday my birthday is on wednesday the 19th of january and i think i'll be getting the baby bottle uh, from Blue Microphone, so that should be pretty, pretty uh, legit. Uh, once that comes in, I'll switch things around uh, for the sound for uh, the show and live streams and things of that nature. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what's going on right now. And just excited for the club as well. For those listening for the first time, I know we've we've taken you know a good long break uh, over the holiday. Uh, definitely introduce uh, the Alliance Academy Club, and just wanted to let you know if you're listening this to this later, it's definitely inspired by Professor X's um, you know mansion, you know that particular school uh, for the gifted, um, and as well as Wakanda Learning Institute. I was thinking about that when I was trying to decide exactly what I was going to name the club itself. Uh, something that I can feel comfortable um, sharing a whole bunch of information in, whether it's tech, gaming, and entertainment, you know, finance, and things of that nature, uh, but also being able to vibe out, you know, whenever. So, so that's how that came about. So I'm excited, and also want to mention, you know, we will open up the floor for comments, questions about anything related to tech, gaming, entertainment after we go over the news updates. Um, of course, um, I believe based on the docket, Danielle is going to give some live streaming tips as well, uh, since she's been in the space for Twitch for a long time and I'm, you know, doing some stuff on YouTube right now. So, so this episode 604 of the podcast is going to be focused on uh, the game news. And then we're going to open the floor later on for, um, any of you uh, who are currently listening, uh, on clubhouse. If you have any questions, comments, anything that, that you want to ask, uh, we'll be able to answer that, you know, according to the topic matter at hand so danielle before we get into it anything what do you got oh, i'm ready i am ready i'm pumped it's a new year our first episode for the year so let's do this yeah so the first thing uh, that we wanted to look at is uh, konami and nfts and i know you wanted to touch on on that so um i'll let you fire that off and then we'll talk about some other things as well all right so a few days ago i guess konami just you know jumped into the nft market the crypto market over here and they 
they sold some stuff uh quite quite a bit actually i think it was like just under 200,000 i think it was 162,000 dollars worth of worth of digital items that they that they sold um i think it's definitely a very interesting I think development that's happening, you know, it's, it's not like it's just recent, really. I think it's recent as far as like mainstream going, but cryptocurrencies have been something that's been, you know, developing for what greater part of a decade now. You're, you're, yeah. you're more into it. I'm still like new and learning about this stuff and wrapping my head about, you know, if this is something I want to jump into, but you have, you know, Konami who's jumping in, who sold ah oh gosh what did they sell one of them um, they sold a digital map of dracula's castle for over twenty six thousand dollars and yeah. you know it comes with a disclaimer it's just i think is is funny and it's also this is what makes me nervous about um i guess digital currencies and, and nfts in general so konami also adds in that konami will only be responsible for granting the use of the nft and purchaser benefits for the nft and will not provide any any guarantee for the nft itself an example you know continuity compatibility with other services etc etc so and they also don't guarantee that the value of it will go up but that's really dependent on how much value somebody puts behind something right correct so like that that's uh that's a definitely an interesting market and i can see other studios you know jumping on this bandwagon whether it to be because they want to support the system that's growing or just to make a quick buck from people who are willing to, you know, jump in and, and buy stuff on, off of it. I mean, I mean, the same way on the flip side, you can also argue that a lot of these items are available for purchase in the very traditional manner. So what is making these digital versions so valuable? Yeah, so so a couple of things with um, I like the fact that companies are taking risks, right? So I definitely want to start there, and uh, the value is part of community, part community, part company, part um, nostalgia. So there's a whole bunch of things that will necess that would potentially add to the value of the NFT. I know someone right now is currently working on uh, an NFT set, and what he I, I got to be clear on this one. Um, without naming anything specific. What he has designed in terms of what I just mentioned, uh, nostalgia, value, and how we feel about those things will immediately or not necessarily immediately raise the value for those NFTs. So I think it's a combination of this. So when you're talking about a map of uh, things that are related to Castlevania, uh, Castlevania is such an iconic game, right? If you were to do things related to Metal Gear or items related to Metal Gear or, or screens that we've seen and 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 a Metal Gear game or something related to Halo. If you were to do something related to uh, the Street Fighter stages, where, whether it's the original uh, Ken stage or Ryu stage, and you put that on a blockchain where somebody can have the value of that, I think that if companies do it right, they're going to make sure uh, to get the value from those things. So I think that even though the space is you know, relatively young, as you mentioned, there is value to be done uh, uh, to be uh, acquired in the space, as well as how the companies are going to introduce it to their uh, customers and consumers, right? So we had backlash recently from, I think it was Ubisoft, when they introduced uh, the pieces for their particular NFTs um, and things of that nature. So I think that it's still young to see, right? what's happening with the space and how com companies are going to introduce the NFTs. But I think that the value is there if they target the right item to make, to mint uh, for, for the NFT. So I like it. I don't necessarily like the backlash the, co the companies are receiving because um, I think that they're really trying to put thought behind what they're doing with the NFTs. But um, I think it's still, um, lacks a little bit of maturity because people are still learning the process of uh, putting on a blockchain and what they should uh, consider um, as NFTs. So I'm excited, but I'm cautious. Um, I don't have any NFTs yet. Um, so just wanted to uh, do full disclosures there, but I do have cryptocurrencies. Would you ever mint your own NFT? I'm not thinking about it now. And I think that that's how I'll probably answer that. That's the safe answer. But I think that if there's something that really catches uh, my attention and I can have a team uh, build something around something I really love, 
I think the answer is potentially, but right now I'm more in the process of uh, acquisition, right, of cryptos that I love, uh, whether that's, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, of course, but, um, and of course, you know, we don't get financial advice when we do talk about the crypto stuff, when I'm in the crypto rooms and stuff like that. But I think that I'm more in the acquisition, the dollar cost averaging stage for the cryptocurrencies, but I'm not necessarily interested. Um, I'm not, inter- I'm not necessarily motivated as much as I am, um, you know, for the acquisition versus, you know, the NFTs, right? I know that they both have their, their place, but uh, I think in the future, potentially, uh, we, we can do something like that. I think for me, coming from my standpoint, I'm I'm a neutral. It's still something that I'm still learning. It's still a foreign language to me. I think I understand the basic foundation of both, you know, digital currencies and NFTs, but I'm just not 100% there yet where I feel confident enough to use my actual money <laughs> to jump in, I think. And, the, and it's more of just the unknown because like, I have you. I can ask you these questions. I And... I think you're the only person that right now that I see that is very clear and to the point. If I have, I have questions for you, you're clear to answer. What I find so weird and so, I guess, I guess where my trust issue comes from is that if I ask anybody else that, that has been in it for a while, that has invested, that's been doing it for like seven, eight, nine years now, they're so elusive about their answers that I'm like, okay. why... Are you dodging my question? <laughs> and they're mm. really basic things. And like uh, the frustrating part is like, go read up on it. I have been. And it's still a foreign language to me that I'm still trying to, you know, get to. And right right now at this current point, um, I have, you know, I have Voyager on my phone. I have, I have Coinbase. I have Gemini. And I haven't fully completed making my profile because it has to have my social security you know and i'm like oh how much should i trust this let, let me go back i don't know i think that's, so a, that's a scary thing i'll for me. say i'll say this real quick i think from what i recall voyager voyager is a, a pretty good one um to to have you know there's a lot of different exchanges of course there's coinbase there is um gemini which i love I love 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 uh, above coinbase actually um and i think uh they're some solid ones that are out there and yeah but again we can talk about it and to be to be completely transparent i don't have all the answers when it comes to the cryptocurrency space i'm confident in what i've done with um with my holdings right and i haven't lost since i lost the bitcoin back in 2017 that's because i was ignorant of the space back then and i didn't know what these things represented had i understood the space the way i do now back in 2017 i would still have a bitcoin that's valued over whatever it is now 40 grand you know whatever it is right now currently trading i don't know cuz i haven't looked at it but i think that the plays that i currently have now Um, long-term plays, I'm very confident in what they're going to do. Some of them are exchanges. Some of them are other coins, Web3 and things of that nature. And I think the the elusive aspect of it that you touched on is because um, some individuals are not, won't be honest enough to say that they don't have all the answers. I know I don't have all the answers, right? I spend time in a lot of rooms that uh, collectively we can answer most questions, but I think that we have to be honest about that. What is you know, a blockchain, do I fully understand it? I know it's a ledger. It keeps great records. You can't change the records. That's all I need to know. Do I need to be super technical about what the blockchain is? Uh, not necessarily. Do I need to learn about the language that creates things on a blockchain? I don't need it to know that for me personally. I just need to know what the plays are going to be, um, great, whatever those great plays are going to be long-term for me. And those are the things that I'm currently investing in right now, being super conservative. Of course, Bitcoin, right? Of course, crypto.com for some. This is not financial advice. These are some of the plays that I'm in. But I think that uh, people are being elusive because they know they can't answer the questions. And rather than saying that, they, um, they rather just tell, hey, go do your own research. And that's valuable. That's extremely valuable, but um, if you have some answers, you should give them uh, while you're doing your own research as well. So that's all I'll say that. Well, to wrap it up, I I think that 
with crypto with nfts i don't see it going away honestly um because people are putting value and importance behind it um definitely more so now and i'm not talking about the like the meme coins or anything like that but just overall i mean you have you have so many people jumping into the metaverse and buying up, you know, this digital land. You have games that are coming out that are offering, you know, for you to earn crypto. Um, I I only see that going up and, and further and developing even more. I mean, people can be as skeptical about it as they want. I mean, let's like let's put it into something that is has received a lot of scrutiny like VR. VR has gotten a lot of scrutiny and look at where it's at now. It's only getting better. I I know that Xbox in the past has said that they're not going to be jumping into that. But you know what? I think I see it in their future. Um, so with with this whole digital world that's developing around us, I think the only smart thing to do is really to educate yourself. Whether it is reading, even though people should tell me what books I should be reading <laughs> um, or sources. Uh, I think it's just something to keep your eye on for sure. And, um, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still getting there. I'll get around to it. Yeah, I think I think it'd be good. As far as books, the Bitcoin standard, that's a good one. And then Amazon, which uh, I believe you have. Cryptopia is a good documentary, which will amplify uh, what this thing is and why people are making such a big deal about it. Um, and yeah. So those two, those two are great starts. And I know you read a lot of books in, in your time, so uh, you could probably go through that and, you know, pretty quickly. There's somebody I came across that uh, wrote a book about digital currency. Um, and every section or every chapter I noticed is minted NFT. So you have to buy each one to read the entire book. Oh, that's, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of it. There's enough information on the web to to really educate yourself and be grounded. And there's a lot of books too, um, which uh, Bitcoin standard might be a heavy read for some. I know you're super smart and you're a genius, so I'm not worried about that. Um, there is also cryptocurrency investing for dummies. That book is very uh, thorough as well. It's a textbook. Some people may not like textbooks. That's a good one, um, which I'm currently reading myself. And uh, Bitcoin standard is really good. And then for live streaming, we'll talk about you know live streaming stuff. A little bit later um so yeah so you mentioned vr uh playstation uh psvr2 uh that was recently announced your thoughts on that what do you got um i'm kind of excited i'm glad that really sony is really doubling down and keeping with the uh, the vr side of it because to be honest i i did i bought day one the the original psvr and i loved it and it just made me want to go and try the other ones i have a rift i have a oculus quest um i really want the quest 2 uh, but the PSVR 2 is something else I also would really want to add to my collection as well. I mean, they, they're they going to be adding it on so that it's a, you know, a headset-based controller tracking. So that means that you, you won't have to use the external camera like we did for um, the original PSVR. has a better display. It's going to be offering 4K, a wider um, field of view. I, I think it's awesome. And I, I think... Um, having it tied to PlayStation is a great introduction for people. I mean, the quest is a really awesome intro to, you know, VR having that experience, but, um, to have it tied to, you know, a PlayStation library is, is just as, just as great. Um, I I'm excited for it. I want it. So that's where I'm I will with it. pass right now. Because I'm still, well, you know, like for me, I'm still playing shooters, right? I'm still playing uh, Destiny heavily, right? Which Queen is next month. Uh, so there's nothing really pulling me into VR right now. Maybe Metaverse stuff at some point. I'll consider uh, Oculus. Was it the second one? Yeah. Version two? Plus two. Yeah. Right. So at some point, I'll probably consider that. But for me right now, it's really uh, shooters, Um creator economy stuff that's really heavy on on my list right now with the youtube and and i know you're going to talk about more live streaming stuff a little bit later uh, so i think that's been the thing and even with um with halo which we'll touch on in a little bit um I, we have some thoughts there but as far as the the vr world i'm i'm gonna be leaning on you for a lot of the stuff that's particularly um you know booming in that in that space right now i think it's fantastic for what it does and what it represents i'm not against it i'm just not in it uh, yet 
So, so that's what I'll say there. You, even if it had Horizon on PSVR, because they did announce that too at the same time, Horizon Call of the Mountain would be one of their titles to that you know, might, dive that might, deeper to the yeah. you know, world of Horizon. I that think, might do it. Yeah. I think that that's amazing, and I think it's really cool, and, and I love it. I mean, the PSVR, yeah, it had a uh, it had its downsides, but it also had a lot of great upsides, and I still see people. Um, you know, jumping in and, and giving it a try and now that's a little bit cheaper and like they're adding on VR games to their PlayStation um, Plus free games. So the, the possibilities are there. I'm just, I'm just glad that they're continuing on with it and they're offering, um, you know, an upgrade, a new a new version. It's, it's exciting. And the PS5 is just, um, I love my PS5, but that's just me. I know I ended the year last year on shows saying that Xbox is great, but I still love my my PlayStation. It still offers things that I really love and enjoy, although it could do better on its library. But that's the yeah, it, story. it definitely <laughs> right. It definitely could do well on this uh, on this library. But um, as you you saw over the holiday and to now because of the shortage, the changes that uh, they'll have to make. I think we have that a little bit later, but since we're in the metaverse stuff and the VR stuff, uh, Walmart is getting into the metaverse. So there's that. And uh, that was uh, an article, I believe, from The Verge. Walmart is getting serious about the metaverse. The company's recent trademark filings indicate plans for NFTs and cryptocurrencies, which we kind of touched on, you know, our thoughts on NFTs and cryptocurrencies. Any any thoughts on that? And then we'll move on. Um. You know, it'd be great. I, I don't care. I don't. I don't fully see it. Like I, I, I see it as is developing. You know, as I mentioned, uh, that it, it, it's only going to get bigger. And you have companies like this. I know we were talking about you know Konami getting into it. I know that Square Enix has been talking about getting you know hoping that the blockchain and all of those digital stuff uh, further progress but to see like just name brand, brand stores jumping in and you know wanting to be there at the beginning and get ahead of their competition i think is the, is the biggest reason why i think it's just going to be here for a long time now what i want okay if i have like my own house or whatever it may be in the metaverse here if i'm buying a physical item from walmart Oh, there better be like some QR code or something like that. I don't, I don't know what it's going to be called, so that I can have it in my little digital house there. <laughs> just, just saying. I don't want to have to rebuy something I physically bought, in you know, just so I can put it in this digital world of mine. Um, I don't, I don't. My imagination isn't there yet to even see what the possibilities can possibly hold for having like you know brick and mortar store like walmart jumping into it but yeah it's it's, it's, it's um i'm going i'm sorry go ahead no but it, it's definitely something it's definitely interesting to watch and emerge yeah it's uh the retail giant filed for several trademarks on december 30th suggesting plans to start selling virtual goods including electronics toys appliances sporting equipment apparel home decor and more as noted by the CNBC. So that's uh, a little bit more on that particular article. Uh, next, th next thing we have. Well, so this okay, one wait, is interesting. Let, let me, let me just add a, one more thing that, and Go that's ahead. like, that's a big reason why I say like, if I'm buying these physical things, I want some, I want it to be translated into the digital world that Walmart has. And I hope that there's some tie in somewhere there because I know that, you know, they like the article also mentions about physical fitness training and services, which is, it already from the last especially since COVID happened you know you have the AR and VR uh, world of things really jumping on the entire physical fitness aspect of, of other stuff and um, I for working formerly at your which is a VR fitness app tracking which expanded into you know actual real world applications to not just only track VR the one thing that really kind of lacks sometimes in in VR if you're not playing a game is having that physical visual i guess you can say not necessarily physical but a visual thing is if you're working out in vr it, it's nice if to visually see you know a weight in your hand but if i go to walmart and i buy some like eight pound dumbbells and i scan a qr code or whatever it is and i'm going to do a workout in vr or ar that what i put on my headset or whatever it may be 
that I not only have it physically there, but I also have it like and see it virtually. I, I kind of want some tie in somewhere there because I cannot picture myself going to shop in digital matrix Walmart to buy, I don't know what, some furniture, some clothes, and also have to buy it again just so that I can experience it physically. That, that, that's where I'm kind of drawing the line, and that's where I'm kind of hoping that there is some tie-in. Gotcha, gotcha. So the uh, the next thing that I uh, definitely want to touch on is um, a big game. Uh, Xbox celebrated its 20th anniversary, from what I understand, like last November, right? November to December. And then they came out with a game that we've been waiting for a long time. Uh, many of us, you know, in the shooter world have been waiting for a long time. Halo Infinite, uh, that dropped. Um, absolutely amazing. Uh, they did drop the uh, multiplayer component first, and then they dropped uh, the campaign uh, later. Um, and so far so good, but are we still, and I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this based on the landscape, you know, for the game right now, are we still entertained by Halo Infinite from what you've seen on social media from your standpoint, Daniel? I think the core fans are, but I don't think the majority are. I think they were hyped for that moment and then they have the attention span to be like, Ooh, something new and then jump onto that hype train and forget that halo existed. Interesting. Yeah. So, and, and that's what I'm actually picking up on right now. I had a conversation with a great friend of mine and we were, we loved halo ever since we started playing halo back in the day. And I'm looking at uh, the landscape of social media from the, you know, Twitter, uh, IG and all that stuff where people are usually uh, doing a lot of clips and things of that nature for the game. Um, this is one of the biggest games that we've been waiting for uh, for the year. It accomplished a lot uh, when it launched. And of course, we love Master Chief uh, for so many reasons, uh, an iconic character for who he is and what he represents, not only in the lore, but what he represents to individuals who fell in love with the story. So you have that. But at the same time, it's like it seems very, very quiet right now on social media from what I've seen uh, for what I saw back in November or at least fourth quarter of 2021. So um, it's um, so I wanted to just pause there for a second and realize that what they're doing now is changing uh, the prices of some of their cosmetic things to really pull back uh, a surge for individuals to be interested in Halo again uh, for this quarter and into this year, 2022. So th those are my initial thoughts on it right now, based on what I'm seeing. Uh, any uh, additional thoughts for you? Okay. Call me an old timer or a boomer, whatever you want to. Um, I think that is, one of the dark sides and sad sides about social media and gaming is that people, um, gamers, especially content creators, and I understand why they do this, but it's also really sad for studios, is that they'll jump on the next, like the first popular thing, that trending thing, because they want to be in it, because they can make content on it. Uh, but they don't stay with it for the long run because there's going to be a new hot thing that they, it's like that's going to be the trend thing, the it thing. And they want to be in the know. They want to stay on top of the game. Um, so they move on to that thing. And then that thing plays is like, you know, has its run. And then there's a new hot thing after that. Um, so you'll always have that core fan base that's always going to be there. They're always going to be the diehards and they're going to be they're going to enjoy it for the next several years. And, uh, you know, the content creators that are in that pool will be making content on it for the next several years. Um, but I think for the bigger, the bigger overall picture of the general audience, that's where I think some studios like, OK, we got to make this hype so that we sell a lot at the beginning because we're going to die out quick. And I don't, I don't think like, that applies to any one specific game. This is just all of them. Really, it is like you're going to have that next hot game that's going to come out and everybody wants that one. Everybody wants information on that one. And I think that's, that's so sad sometimes because I'm thinking about it as like, you know, um, as a kid or as like 10 years ago, um, you know, before, you know, gaming and Twitch really became the super trendy thing. It's like you will have like gears that came out 
And people are hyped and pumped for that for like months before they're moving on to something else. By months, I mean like a good solid like six months there. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's weird and it's unfortunate a little bit, right? Uh, because the, that's the formula, right? That's that's the formula, and we have some other games that are um, being worked on right now, which we'll touch on later, um, which is probably using the same formula because this is the one that's currently selling, um, for sure. Uh, so that's what we have on Halo Infinite right now. So speaking of you know formula, My Hero Academia is getting a Battle Royale. Daniela, you're an anime uh, resident here. Uh, thoughts on what's happening in that particular space? All right. I, I Do I like My Hero Academia? Yeah, I do. It's a fun anime. If you haven't watched it, definitely go and check it out. You're going to have fun watching it. Now, do I need it as a battle royale? No, absolutely not. If I'm given the opportunity to play it, will I play it? Yes, of course. But, and have, have, I thought we reached that peak of oversaturation of battle royales by now. Um, apparently not. Uh, I, I got, I got nothing to say about this. Like right now I cringe when I hear BR. Really, I do. Cause I'm like, does this, does this genre, does this world really need that? But, but on the flip side, I don't think it needs to be another anime that turns into a fighter as well too. So... I guess if I had to choose which two genres, if I had to make a video game for it, I guess a battle royale would be the better choice because you have like one piece that turns into like, you know, another fighter. You have that for Dragon Ball. You have that for almost any anime. So I guess uh, it's a nice switch up. I'm just so tired of battle royales. <laughs> okay. So you have the latest issue of Weekly Jump Reveals, Bandai Namco has announced free-to-play Battle Royale My Hero Academia, Ultra Rumble for PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC Steam. Uh, and it says here Bandai Namco is also planning to host a closed beta test. Um, I think uh, this is refreshing to me. You know, I don't necessarily uh, mind seeing more Battle Royale games um, if I can, you know, test it out and see what it's like. Um, I like anime. I'm not in the anime world like you are, but I do like anime. So it would be a good thing to check out once they start, um, you know, releasing and showing that a little bit more. Yeah, I guess. I did like what Dragon Ball did in making a whole storyline of the world and you're playing it from that aspect. But I don't know. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You're done on that. Okay, so we're done on that too. Uh, next thing we have is uh, God of War on PC. Is there outrage? Should there be outrage? God of War on PC. God of, God of War has been an exclusive game for PlayStation for a very, very long time. And now we have individuals who are uh, still trying to decide should PC gamers uh, get the opportunity to play these games that have been exclusive for such a long time on a platform that has an open architecture versus a platform that has a closed, semi-closed at this point, architecture, which are the consoles. Daniela got a one PC. I don't mind. That's the initial thoughts. What are your thoughts? I think it's fantastic. I think it's absolutely great for them to do this. Granted, I think they've they've had some sprinkles of other, you know, PlayStation games that came to PC, but for exclusives, I think Horizon is one and then I can't think of any others that were exclusive to to PlayStation. But when it came to PC, it was huge. You know, people loved it, got to experience it, and people so super supportive. I wouldn't say there's any outrage. There is an there is a slight disappointment that it takes Sony so long to port these. And I think going forward, it really would benefit them for them to have that option. Can it still be exclusive to PlayStation? Yeah, sure. But it shouldn't have such a long wait time in between to be ported to PC. I think that should be immediately from the beginning. That should be part of the, pro the thought process, part of the 
the design process part of everything. You should be there at the beginning. Like, hey, we are going to have this on PC. It will come, you know, maybe three months after launch on PlayStation or six months after launch. Not any of this one, two, three years before we get, you know, our PC friends get to play it and experience it. I understand they want to sell, you know, more consoles. They want to do all those things. But I think that's where that's hurting them because you have Xbox who comes in here. They have their Game Pass. They have it available day one. You know, you can play, you know, these console games on PC day one from there. It would benefit them for them to have that already. They're already behind. So if they want to stick it in the long run, they want to maintain their player base. They want to maintain that traction for what they do. They got to think about those things. They have to add it on. That, that's, that's all I say. I'm glad that it's finally here. I think there's a lot of, you know, positive feedback on it. People are loving it. I mean, even our next topic, they, they show that they had a huge amount of concurrent players specifically for God of War on Steam. So. Absolutely. God of War PC attracted over 60,000 concurrent Steam players on its release day. So there, there's love there for a PC. And, and I think that, um, you know, after making the transition, you know, to mostly PC now, I love it. I love what, what it represents. I love that I could upgrade the parts I need to upgrade. I don't necessarily need to wait for a life cycle for a console to either change or upgrade uh, to make adjustments to my PC. There was a particular time where I wanted to play Call of Duty Vanguard when it released last year, fourth quarter of last year, and I couldn't play it because of the parts that my PC had. So I upgraded the motherboard and I was able to make some new adjustments to my PC to play games um, at higher fidelity and quality. Also upgraded the graphics card as well last year. So I think that we have the opportunity and, and the beauty to make these adjustments especially when you're dealing with uh, the open architecture that is the PC with a closed architecture that is semi-closed architecture. I need to make sure I say that because of where we are with consoles today. You don't necessarily have the ability to make that many changes and adjustments. I know uh, PlayStation 3, Daniela, introduced the hard drive changes, right? Yeah. Three? And maybe Xbox 360 gave you an opportunity to upgrade our hard drives as well back in the day. But I think that we're at a good place where we're seeing companies make adjustments not for us only for them because the pandemic really introduced different options for companies to allow the exclusives to be released on other platforms mainly pc for the particular context of what we're talking about right now so i think it is amazing i think we're in a good place i think it's exciting and i think the fact that god of war pc attracted over sixty thousand concurrent steam players on release day I think that's saying that uh, this is a valuable thing to see. We're also going to see Uncharted at some point release uh, for PC players as well. Um, I think that's going to be like a bundle collection of the campaign modes for Uncharted. We should be seeing that as well. Any final thoughts on this? Play all the Sony games. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's all I was saying. No, but um, <laughs> but no, you you are right. I just I just want to see that more. I mean, I I have both. I have the PS5. I have my PS4 Pro that's hooked up and it's being used still at my PC. Um, I like having options and I think having, you know, narrowing yourself, whether regardless if you're Sony or Microsoft, limiting yourself does not help. And Xbox has definitely learned that lesson. Just Sony needs to step it up here. Come on. Get with the rest of us. Absolutely. Absolutely agree on that. Uh, Sony did decide recently to keep making PS4 Due to the PS5 shortages, you have a PS5. Uh, what are your current experiences with your PS5 right now? How do you? How do you? Uh, I love it. It's um, <laughs> it's the only console on my. Well, no, no, that's a lie. Uh, I have my Switch right here, but uh, yeah, it's the only you know home stay right here for me. It's my PS5. I love it. Um, if I can find another one, I'm going to go and get that as well. Uh, but I'm also using my PS4 Pro still, which is the one I got for my, my Death Stranding Edition one. Um, that's actually in my living room and that's still being used. And I haven't, I haven't myself used, like used it regularly, um, probably since I got my PS5. So like a, like a year, some change there. I haven't, um, used it, but my son, who introduced his his girlfriend to gaming, it's it's 
I absolutely adore my son's girlfriend, but she's never really played any video games at all. Um, at least what we consider video games. She plays mobile games. And she asked, she's like, is there something that's like this game? And it was like some shoot 'em up on her phone where you just use your thumb. And I was like, yeah, we have like Resogun. I think that's how it's called. It's the very, the first free game that you got on your PS4 day one. <laughs> that game I was like there's this but she's also been playing she tried out it takes two and um a way out which I love both those games they've been co-oping it and just seeing that on my tv in the living room I was like wow this actually still looks really really good <laughs> so they're both still being heavily used and I adore both of them um, I do have some PS5 games that I'm looking forward to to playing this year. So I have no complaints. Yeah, so I'm if there's any console I end up getting at some point, it's probably going to be the PS5 before a new Xbox because most of the games, not everything, but most of the games that I play now, I can play through the Xbox Game Pass and Steam has a wonderful library of titles as well so i'm okay right now in terms of uh trying to consider a new system right now i think that this round of um, purchasing i'm okay pc is doing everything that i need right now and i'm really loving it so a uh, ps5 looks fantastic there's not enough games yet to pull me into that particular world but i'm sure at some point they're going to announce something where i just have to play it on the platform once they release it so uh, those are some additional thoughts with that uh, next thing that we have is dying like two's developer promises at least five years of post launch content for dying light we have some history with dying light daniela give give a little bit of history of us with dying light and then we'll talk about some of the other things with this game wow i think i think we got our first real taste and touch of dying light oh man e3 2018 i think or was it yeah i think it was 2018 we saw them again in 2019 and like i think at that time they had a they were close to being done and then they got delayed i don't know how many times by this point um but no, the team there is fantastic. And I always understand no matter what studio it is. Like, I'm I'm one of those gamers that's super understanding about delays. I don't get mad. But they delayed one too many times. They, they were doing a cyberpunk to us <laughs> with, with those things. Um, But no, to see that, you know, it's right around the corner now. That is fantastic. What I considered a red flag now, thanks to Destiny, um, is when a game says that they will have content and, you know, things to look forward to over X amount of years. To me, that's a red flag. <laughs> like, I, I don't put any, I don't put too much value into it. If you come out with stuff, great. If you don't, and like the base game is super enjoyable, you have fun, has some replayability, that's awesome. Uh, but I, I, I don't agree with studio saying that they'll have stuff for you to play, to continue coming back for some set amount of time. Because Destiny, when Destiny 1 came out, what did they say? 10 years? Yeah, something crazy like it that. It was yeah. a lie. Did people enjoy the game still? Yeah. But I wouldn't say it was 10 years worth of support and content and everything like that. I mean, they had to come out with Destiny 2. That that's not a continuation of Destiny One. Like they were marketing themselves as this next like hype, like intro MMO experience. It wasn't. But um regardless of how I feel about, you know, dying light there, I just I just don't like it when, when studios do that. I really don't. You it's a it's a red flag for me. Question for you. What's up? What would you rather have? Like um quarterly updates or uh, half of the year updates. What 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 would you prefer? Mm, I prefer like semi annual updates, something new. Okay. Quarterly okay. might be a little bit too much because there's other games I still want to enjoy too. Um, and then there's the stress of like, oh my gosh, and like I have to finish this before the next one comes out. Every six months is nice, but I don't I don't put too much. 
I guess, value into, you know, I'm going to have stuff for the next five years. Like, look at Animal Crossing. That that went, like, what, two and a some odd years before we got some, like, DLC there? Like, it had a lot of fun events. And I think that's what made um, a whole lot of difference for that one specifically. But I don't see... Uh, games like Dying Light to fall into that genre where it needs that much or for that long post-launch content. Okay. So I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm reading the, the headline again. Promises at least five years, right? And there's a lot of things that we're, we're expecting between now and uh, five years from now in terms of the formulas that are working, so I'm just thinking along those lines. So you have your battle royales, you have your fighters. Those tend to do extremely well, even though we may not like them, depending on the genre that we prefer, right? Then you have the subscription model of being a able to play games as soon as they launch on a particular uh, platform, whether you like PlayStation stuff or Xbox Game Pass stuff, right? So you have those things. So I think that if you're a true Dying Light fan, right, when you're looking at the game and it's saying at least 500 hours to complete, that's pretty, um, that, that is pretty exciting for those who are super uh, fans of Dying Light 2. But for those who are not, but they just appreciate the genre, they may not necessarily put that much time into the game. Yeah, I think that's fair across the board. We see it all the time with games that come out and have a short uh, span. What was that game that came out? It was like Gears, but it was more like a Destiny type of Gears with uh, people can fly. Out, out runners, out, out something. Outriders. I can't even think about it. Outriders, right? Very short, beautiful game, short life, if you will. Uh, I think that was um, Square Square Enix or Square Enix, depending on how you want to say that. Um, so it's like we see formulas all the time. We see adjustments. We see pivots. I think that um, I may check it out, but I know I'm not going to put 500 hours into it. Any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, if you're looking at that, that perspective there, it's great. Um, and you know what? If they do and they do, you know, serve that over the next five years, that's awesome. Come year six, come like not even year six, come like halfway through like year four, you better be announcing Dying Light 3 because the only reason why you're going to be putting, at least for me, the uh, way I'm thinking about it, the only reason why you're going to be having five years worth of post-launch content is to keep people interested, keep people like involved in this world of yours so that you can continue on with your storyline and have a three. And that those same people are going to jump on it. They're enjoying it. Oh, I love 3. I loved all the content. I loved all the DLC. I liked where the story went. I'm very, you know, invested into this character. I, this this world. Yes, bring me a Dying Light 3. That's, that's where I'm at with it. But for me, 500 hours? That is some Witcher time frame there. <laughs> Absolutely. To me, that's overwhelming. And for me, when I see that, I'm like, okay, that's... That's too much. Where's my, where's my short games? <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely a lot. So you so you have that uh, for Dying Light Two. Next thing that uh, we want to touch on is Respawn reportedly working on a single player FPS with a focus on mobility and style. So we had some speculations with what would be considered mobility and what would be considered style so daniela uh definitely uh, start us there and then i'll touch a couple of things on what i'm seeing in this article i'm thinking like mirror's edge stuff here okay but i'm also like with that you mean the titan titanfall kind of had that you know it had mobility it had style it was really nice so we're looking towards something like that i don't know I, I think those I don't two mind. words don't give a whole lot of. And that could be intentional, right? Yeah. I, I'm i thinking at some point we might run along the walls again. And what the shooter will be. So 
what the shooter will be will have to be something that's super competitive, especially when you have games on the market like Apex Legends, right? It has to be. It has to either set the bar even higher because when Apex Legends first was introduced, we weren't even aware, unless you were an insider, right? You work there or whatever. You weren't even aware that the game was coming out and it just came out of nowhere. So that's going to be interesting to see uh, what's going to happen with that particular world. So the article here says uh, the report follows Respawn creative director Mohammed Alavi's recent announcement. He's departing the studio after 11 years to pursue his next adventure. Um, and it says Alavi leading development of a brand new single player adventure at the company first mentioned in a job listing posted last year and news of his departure prompted some to ponder the fate of the project. Okay. So there's that. But in terms of what here, it just talks about apex legends a little bit and mentions uh, Jedi falling order, which is the star war game, but it doesn't necessarily give specific details about what the mobility and style will represent. It just reiterates it again. It says with its designers placing a particular focus in mobility and style. So you're going to play, you're going to not play, but you're going to pay for cosmetic things. When you're talking style, in my opinion, you're going to pay for cosmetic things. So if you're looking at mobility and I'm thinking, let's just go with speculation here. Um, Master Chief for many years did not have a, Batman-esque grappling hook. Now he has that, so he can go pretty much anywhere on a big map in Halo Infinite, right? So if we're talking about mobility like that, where you're going to be able to grapple things and even in addition to that, run on walls, that should be very interesting. So those are my speculation there as far as guiding principles. Uh, you're going to pay for cosmetics. Any additional thoughts here? Um. Just to remember that he did not, like, it's not going to be a Titanfall sequel. And I think with those two descriptions there, that's, I'm not going to speculate about what he means by it. Because uh, from what I take from it, they're still trying to plan out what this game is going to be like. Before they even start working on what the final product should be or gearing towards. And, I mean, we've had games like that who started off with a great idea and then having to go back and, like, okay, we're scratching this. This isn't working out. So I'm going to wait. What is it? They're not even looking to move forward with whatever their concept is until next year. That's a lot of time. There's a lot of changes that can happen into there. And they're going to be feeling out what the market needs to really make a successful game. So I'm just going to leave it as like that. that going to let it go because a lot can change uh my case in point there you have um what is it? uh ubisoft's uh, skull and bones they had a great concept they had the thing they had an idea that oh people love pirates they love ships they came out with this we saw it i played it at i think e3 2018 i think and then next thing you know that was scrubbed and it, it wasn't canceled it was scrubbed and redone by a whole other different studio with a kind of a different concept there. So a lot can change between what they're saying now to what they're going to like settle on like ending of this year, beginning of next year to create this product. Yeah, I dig that. I dig that. If you're listening live, uh, thank you for being here. Definitely join the Alliance Academy greenhouse at the top. If you're listening later, thank you for listening. Definitely look on clubhouse for the Alliance Academy you'll be able to hang out with us next time. We will open up the floor after we cover the news topics. Uh, next thing that we have here, LinkedIn to launch audio events later this month. Danielle, any thoughts on that? I got to update my LinkedIn. I, don't, I, don't, I like LinkedIn <laughs> okay. just as it is. Kind of like this digital resume. Maybe you get to like meet some other people in the industry in a very professional manner, but just leave it alone. I, I'm I'm good. I didn't jump on the whole like fleet story thing. I don't post pictures. I don't I don't I don't do any of that in there. That is my walking living resume. Leave it alone. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting because we realize that a lot of these companies are making sure that they're providing 
a a software suite, if you will, uh, for lack of better terms right now, uh, on their platform that's attractive to individuals to come on the platform to either create content or, you know, just to be more active, right, have more active users. I know that I recently saw an article where it says that even Brave, Brave Browser, uh, recently crossed over 50 million monthly active users uh, at the end of fourth quarter of last year. So I don't necessarily see that uh, this is a bad thing. Although we have your clubhouse applications, we have uh, Twitter spaces, then we have green room and all the things that we have right now uh, for creating content. And a lot of these platforms are giving creators uh, the opportunity to earn income uh, for those platforms as they create as well. So I don't necessarily think this is necessarily a good or bad thing. And we have to um, think it out loud here recognize that the LinkedIn has become a major social platform, not just exclusive to what we um, used to see it for, right? Or see it as um, just a platform for networking and professional environment where people are creating all types of content on the platform now. And this is going to be another avenue for them to do that. So I think it's exciting times for any, any individual who create content. If you're part of the creator economy, I think this is extremely important. Any additional thoughts on that? I get it. You want to be on top of it, just like the rest of content creator world there. They want to be on top of the new trending things. But if you're good at something, don't flood it with all this other noise. That's my personal opinion. Like, I w- I'll be surprised if it really takes off. I think it's just messy. That That's just me, though. I, I don't go to LinkedIn for those things. Okay. We should, we should revisit it. We should see what happens and then maybe consider revisiting, see how well it's doing. See, you know, let's, let's see, keep an eye on it. Okay. If you say so. (laughs) We'll definitely see what's going on with that. Next thing that we have is rainbow six extraction is coming to Xbox and PC uh, game pass at launch. This looks really good to me, even though I haven't played a lot of Rainbow Six in the last uh, few years. Thoughts on this? I'm excited. Um, It's probably one of the shooters that I kind of actually really like. And I I got into Rainbow Six Siege a little bit late. Um, But it's enjoyable. I like the pace of it. So I'm kind of like really super excited. I'm stoked that it's going to be on the Game Pass at launch. So I'll be there. Yeah, definitely looks good. And guys, if you're enjoying this conversation, if you're listening live, please ping someone here, ping a friend, ping a couple of friends. Uh, This is the Alliance Academy. We'll be creating uh, different genres of content under this umbrella. Uh, So if you're enjoying the conversation, please let some friends know. We will open up the floor uh, for comments and questions about the topics after we're done with the current topics at hand. Uh, Daniela has a wonderful section where she's going to be giving you streaming tips and tools uh so definitely looking forward to that i did check out the anacrusis which is an early access game on xbox game pass i downloaded it last night last night being the 15th of january um and it's a shooter survival with the vibe of the uh, star trekky old outfits if you will and uh, you have to make sure that you stay away from the zombies uh, and work together to escape different rooms kind of vibe. Uh, it is on the Xbox Game Pass. It is called the Anacrusis. Uh, it's in early access right now uh, for the Xbox Game Pass. Uh, so just wanted to touch on that. I played it last night. Pretty cool. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because the game that really has me most of the time is Destiny 2. Uh, and any thoughts on that before the next one? Nope, I'm good. Okay, next thing we have is Steam Deck. Steam Deck releasing on time. Daniela, thoughts on that? Um, That's great, especially since they announced that they're going to be delayed. So now they're like, no, we take it back. Psych, we got you. I think that's great. I mean, I pre-ordered, but because like I think I pre-ordered the day after it opened up and like there's a huge flood. I'm not getting mine until like quarter three of this year, which that is perfectly fine with me. Um, Gives me a little bit more time to save up money. I'm cool with that. I'm patient with it. And I'm hoping with wave one and wave two, whatever bugs are in those, um, I'm cool waiting. Those people can deal with whatever bugs and hopefully by wave three, which I think is my reservation, um, it's kind of ironed out. 
I, I'm I'm still excited about it. Yeah, I'm still excited about it as well. I still have the Steam um, device that at one point when they were cleaning the house, they were selling it for five bucks. So I still do have that. What I actually want to do right now is put that uh, device in the living room and get an extender for my internet uh, network so I'm able to connect the Steam device to that so I can play some games on a projector through that network because I still have that and I still want to put it to use. And that device is one of the greatest devices that they released. I know at one point Steam was doing some consoles. I don't know if they're still doing that. And now they have the Steam Deck being released uh, this quarter or early quarter of next year. Um, I did pre-order that, but I don't know if I'm going to jump on it right away, even though I pre-ordered the... um, whatever, the six, the $500 one, whatever it is, the last tier. And I still, I still have to be honest with myself. I'm not as mobile, especially these days and times. Uh, so is it going to provide that much value for me right now if I consider dropping 600 bucks on that where I can put that um, somewhere else, right? So just considering those things and those are the thoughts that I have on it right now. Anything else? Um, I do have that scene. It's in my in my living room right now. It's actually really good for the Steam Link and you know using Big Picture. Highly recommend it because mine is in my living room. Uh, when we have guests over, we want to play some like couch co op game, some Overcooked or anything like that. That is pretty much my go to Jack um, party games. Same thing. Definitely, definitely good. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So if you're not gonna keep your reservation, I'm keeping mine. I'll be here. I think I got the biggest <laughs> one, $649, I think it was. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the one. That's insane. But, you know, it is going to be uh, competing against the Switch and some of these other devices. But we'll see. We'll see. I didn't take off the pre-order yet. It's still there, but we'll go from there. So we'll jump into some movie stuff. Uh, let's talk about Netflix is raising its prices again. Uh, thoughts on that? I'm going to pay for it. Okay. I get a lot of value out of Netflix, so I don't mind paying that subscription fee. It's probably that one and Hulu are like my ultimate right there. I mean, I do have Disney Plus and I do have HBO, but my Hulu and my Disney Plus and my ESPN Plus, even though I don't use ESPN, that's covered through my Verizon bill. Like it's free as long as I have their unlimited plan. <laughs> So I'm good on that. So Netflix raising their price. You know what? I'm going to pay for it. I think it's like $1.50 more um, to my plan. So I I like it. I mean, they have a lot of great movies that they've, like, you know, Netflix production that I enjoy. And I think it's worth my investment. So I'm not going to complain about it. Okay. So we have here the new monthly plan price. Uh, standard plan is now fifteen fifty. Over the previous $14, as you mentioned, and the new price uh, for the 4K premium plan is $20 from $18. And that's what we have there for the pricing of uh, the Netflix, if you will. Matrix, Matrix, uh, let's, oh man, Matrix. Daniela, go ahead. Don't watch it. There you go. That's it? (laughs) All right, that's, that's, all right, that's, that's, that's all right. We're gonna that's okay. It. We we want to go in uh, on Matrix Resurrections here. A, a we want to go bit, on this a, a little, a little we, bit, uh... a, just a little bit, just a little bit, and then because you know you have you have uh, the tools and tips uh, section. So just a little bit, we can revisit another time. But just I'll share my stuff. You share your stuff. You go first. Okay. So for as much hype build up. For this movie, I should have saw that as red flags too. But I was disillusioned because it had Keanu Reeves. And I love Keanu Reeves along with the rest of the world. But it is definitely one movie that is a very obvious cash grab. And relies way too heavily on nostalgia. And just repeats of you know what happened on 1, 2, and 3. And did it have a lot of action? Did it look really cool? Yes. Did the did all the CG look really cool and the fight scenes? Yes. But that's kind of it. Like the story was, are you kidding me right now? I, I'm just going to, you can go your entire life never watching Resurrections. In fact, if you haven't watched it, 
Forget it even existed. This is like Gears Judgment. Where you know what? That game never existed. It's not canon to that, the that Gears y'all, universe. I like I like Gears Judgment. I like Gears so, Judgment. I like Gears Judgment. You and probably maybe ten other people. Okay. <laughs> But Ma- Matrix Resurrections could have just never existed and happened. There you go. Okay, I think you that's it. You've said enough on that. Uh, next thing I did see, I'm not even going to touch it. Next thing you've seen uh, recently, I've seen with you briefly, is Moon Knight. Uh, full trailer is going to be revealed on Monday the 17th of January. Uh, it's another thing on disney plus i have it i need to watch more things on disney plus didn't even know that this was a thing that was coming out and um there you have it moon night a full trailer will be revealed on january the 17th uh so definitely look for that Uh, definitely follow disney plus on twitter they post a lot of different clips and stuff like that for things coming up thoughts on that um so this is where in the marvel universe where i start not knowing who these characters are <laughs> i have no idea because like i know person's. i know i am um, yeah when you start going out of the canon more well-known characters the mainstream characters that's where on the marvel side of things i kind of start having little to no knowledge of is it cool that they're adding okay. on yes um <laughs> Funny enough, he kind of reminded me of Batman, which I'm pr- pretty sure somewhere in a, somewhere in the comic book world probably made that kind of tie in somewhere, some way. But uh, I mean, I'm going to check out the trailer. Who doesn't like superheroes? Who doesn't like a dark past? Come on, yeah. It's like the Mar. That's not like Marvel really does a bad job on their movies or TV shows. So it's going to do good. How well received yeah, got, this character gonna is going to be, I don't know because. You know, you you have a lot of people who are being introduced who are introduced to the Marvel universe from like Iron Man one, and so what they know of it, if they haven't taken the time out on their own to go and read comics, um, what they know of the universe of Marvel is whatever is being produced right now, which is perfectly fine. Um, and I just hope that translates into them, you know, selling comics and. You know, kids having new superheroes to fall in love with and grow up with. Yeah, I am going to check it out because it looks interesting. This character, Moon Knight, uses crescent darts as weapons. And movies uh, that they were in include Spider-Man Identity. I don't know what that one is, but also Moon Knight. So there's some books out, of course, I'm sure. It shows here Moon Knight Volume 1. Uh, so there are some books related to this character, which I'm sure where it was inspired to even have a series of any type, right? So there's that. So Moon Knight, definitely check that out if that's your thing. Uh, next thing, some applications. Well, actually, one application that was brought to my attention very recently. So if you're listening to this, uh, this is um, a gem here. I didn't even know this thing existed. Uh, This is a Clubhouse application that you can use on your desktop. This is called Club Deck. Club Deck, okay? A Clubhouse application for your desktop. So if you want to use, you know, professional uh, microphones, XLRs, mixers, and throw uh, sounds in there and things like, like that, if you are listening and this is the part that excited you throughout the entire episode, that's for Uh, of 604 club deck a clubhouse application that you can use on your desktop you put in your phone number you log in as if you're logging it on your phone it opens it up and it offers some pretty cool features you can find it at clubdeck.app that's clubdeck.app definitely check that out um thoughts on that daniela you brought that to my attention so yeah because that's what i am using actually um so I don't know if anybody notices the difference between using the Clubhouse app on your phone or, um, you know, me using it on the, you know, desktop app here. It's actually pretty nice. The only thing I think I did notice, as I mentioned to Andrew at the beginning of this, that it doesn't show that I have a notification for anything because Andrew sent an invite for this room and I did not see it until he pinged me. He's like, hey, I sent it to you. Um, So that's like probably one of the drawbacks. But other than that, I think it has the full functionality. It's really nice and wide. So unlike, you know, in the app, 
uh, you have your one single screen, you have to click on there. It kind of shows in this nice spanning way. Think of it as different columns, kind of like how um, TweetDeck is. You know, you have your different columns for what's going live right now. We have our current room. I have my notifications. I have, you know, I have certain different columns for different things that are happening. And it just continues opening kind of like Trello. Um, so it's actually quite nice and I'm able to natively record on my PC here. So it's, there's a lot of functionality that, um, we can possibly get out of this and just know this isn't an official, um, you know, app, uh, by clubhouse, uh, and you can't be signed in on both your clubhouse account on, on desktop and on your phone. So you have to log out of one of them. Um, to be able to use it. So that's that's pretty nice. So you're not having some complications there. Or somebody being shady. But I like it. I like it. It has a lot of uh, good shortcuts to use. And it's versatile. It has a dark mode. Which I think everything should come with dark mode. But hey. Yeah, this was this was a gem. Uh, definitely thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to start using it. And hopefully I can figure out what's going on with my mixer to uh, use the XLR microphone that I would like to use with Club Deck on the desktop, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So we got one more thing before the tools uh, section that Danielle is going to bring you the, the hot tools for uh, live streaming, uh, specifically on Twitch in this context, but some of it can apply to other platforms as well. Uh, Twitch streamers are seeking a fairer revenue split. Daniela, this is you. What's going on there? Um, everybody wants that fair, fair payout there and a lower threshold to be able to get, uh, get your money. Because right now your threshold is you don't get a payout until you break the $100 minimum. And then when you do, they deposit it, whatever it may be. But right now it's currently 50-50. Which seems kind of like a lot. Well, it doesn't seem. It is. It is a lot. Um. So basically, if you have a four ninety nine or five dollars sub, you get two dollars and fifty cents of it, and Twitch gets the other two fifty. Um. There is some ad revenue that you get. It's really not that much unless you have a lot of viewers. Um. And they have they have the whole thing about that. I that's a whole other like spiel for me to go in on ads. But I think it is definitely something that needs to be looked at again. Um maybe at that time when they originally introduced that, yeah, it was great. You didn't have such a big audience for um for Twitch or as many streamers that could capitalize on top of that. Now they do. So I think it'd be a lot better. I mean, consider at least 60, 40 in favor of the content creator. At least something. Can't tell me that Twitch isn't making some like boo boo dollars right now. Yeah. Well, you know, they are. Right? Yeah. We all know. Well, you can't tell me that they're not. And what's a, what's, how much is it really going to negatively impact this, like this conglomerate here? To give us 10% more. I would like better. It would be great if it was a 70-30. But uh, definitely uh, you have a lot of people who are going to this post and really upvoting it. And I think it has to get to 20,000 upvotes for it to be being something that they will start talking about or considering. And last that I checked, I think it was just under 13,000. Which I'm amazed there's not like more people who are voting on it. But I guess that means like you really got to really put it out there like, hey vote this up so that they can look at this and consider it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I definitely agree. I just want to add uh, some additional data on the YouTube side, right? Uh, so YouTube standard revenue sharing terms and the YouTube partner program uh, partner channels keep 55% of the money generated from ads on their videos and YouTube first launched a program in 2007. That's the only thing I want to add here in the context of this you know, revenue uh, split things. Any additional um, thoughts on a Twitch? Go ahead. Not just on Twitch, but on Facebook as well, too. So I believe it was the beginning of last year that uh, Facebook Gaming actually announced that they were not going to take their cut, that their content creators and streamers keep 100% of their income, whatever that they made, up until 2023. 
So that's, ad revenue. That's a big deal. So yeah, ad revenue subs. Content creators get 100% of that. And they've been like, I want to say that was early 2021. I'm not 100% sure. I know it was for a long period of time. And I thought that was amazing. So Twitch really has to look at this to be more competitive, to keep people to want to stream on their platform. Because now what was different between then and now is that there is good viable competition. Absolutely. And when you have that, you have to reevaluate how am I going to keep keep our streamers our income flowing in what's going to make it attractive to people whether it be people who are veterans of twitch or new to twitch you got to look at it from that aspect absolutely definitely agree with that uh, so we have okay so we are at the part where uh, daniela you're going to share some tips and tools uh, that you've been using uh, for the Twitch space and uh, you've been on Twitch for a very, very long time and you're getting back into the swing of things. So uh, let us know uh, what are you using? Uh, what do you got going on with Twitch? Okay, so um, it is not completely unknown that I took a very long hiatus of what was supposed to be a month that turned into a year and a half hiatus to um, really for me to recenter myself, to find myself, to just get myself in a mental headspace that was good I was healthy I was kind of working on this like day-to-day basis of just like a routine that felt draining um emotionally mentally like streamer twitter is like a whole other beast of an animal I don't know what other people's like twitter timelines or arguments or hot takes look like but streamer twitter is just there are good people on there. Let me start with that. There are good people on there. There are positive people on there. I love those people. And I know that I can construct my timeline with just the people that I want. But even the people that I just want on there and I just want to see, they're very vocal about their opinions on things. And I I respect that. I understand why they're doing it. And I support them in it. And I voice my things on those things sometimes too. But... It can be so draining when there's just so much anger and it's 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 understandable anger to have um, because we've had so much things that have happened over the last two years. So I just had to step away from it. I had to just not be in the thick of it. And it, it, it has been good because I found out what I wanted to do. So now now this year. I am really definitely putting in effort to focus on what I want my content to look like, what I want to be as a content creator. Has my overall goal that I had from the beginning changed? No, not necessarily. Um, I still want to stream just to have fun, just to meet people, uh, just to raise money for charities as I can. Um, That is still my basic foundation of it. Do I want to hit partner one day? I'm not going to like stress myself out on that one. If I make it one day, sure. Great. If I don't, that's not, that is not success to me. For me, it's just having this chill place to hang out, to have fun, to talk to people, to play games, to, to share what I enjoy. Um, And the way that I have been really focusing on that is just doing the things in an organized manner. I think I fell into that trap of only like putting up and doing things that were the the hype stuff because that's what everybody else around me was doing. And it just wasn't it just wasn't me. At one point I when I realized I was doing that, I was like, no, no, this is just this is making me unhappy. And I, I stepped away for what was supposed to be short and I had to really rethink about that. So now like a year and a half later um to really like dive back into it i have to relearn a lot of things so i'm switching i i've used stream labs for a very long time but there was a there was a, a post that was made by lightstream which we we've done some interviews with lightstream i love what they did i loved what they offered um where they shared what you know stream labs is doing obs has, sh- uh, has shared and came forward about you know really questionable um, business tactics that uh, Streamlabs was doing, and I I can't directly support that anymore. Like it's just morally, I I can't. So I've been switching over to Stream Elements. Um, the only reason why I had I didn't use Stream Elements initially is that um, 
back then, I, it didn't offer everything that I wanted. It was it was too messy for me. And, you know, I was like, at the time, Streamlabs did what I did. I am like, I'm happy with it. So I stuck with it. But with this change, um, and since then, Stream Elements have made huge changes, introduced a lot of things, which I think is absolutely great. And I, I love and uh, it's just relearning all of that and customizing it to fit what my brand is, what my color scheme is, what makes me happy. Um, it's definitely been a very interesting learning curve, but they have a lot of custom made, um, you know, notifications, alerts, and their community is really great at putting this forward and people can use it very easily to customize and to match you and your personality and what you want. So th there's that. And uh, I was also using Overstream. Overstream, sadly, has not been really getting much support. If I if I could, I know I'm an Overstream partner or I was an Overstream partner. Let's just put it that way. The communication on that side has not been very good at all. So I'm very sad to say that one. Um, they still have a service out there, but it hasn't been updated. Um, so I cannot, in all honesty, promote Overstream. I would like to if they come back to it because I really loved what they did. They took customization to a whole other level and that's why I fell in love with them. Um, but until then, Stream Elements has been doing what I needed uh, and I cannot, I cannot boast about them enough. So definitely give them a, a, a definite try. Go and look into it. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but not that bad. And, and their Discord community, um, if you have a hard time finding some of the widgets or the alerts that you want, they have like a whole section in there that you can go through and really, you know, put together your ideal setup. They've made that really super easy. Um, another person, um, I don't have it listed on a docket, but another place to go and check out that has been really great and I really, really love, especially for their closed captioning, is uh, Pixel Chat. They have overlays, they have alerts, they have chats, but what's so great about their closed captioning is that you can invite up to nine other people. So there's there can be 10 people in this thing and when your closed captioning is going off, it can say who's talking, you know, caption for that person. Where right now, closed captioning doesn't necessarily break up about um, saying who is speaking. It just turns into this one long text that seems like it's coming from one person when it really isn't. So they have a way of being able to break that up. And if you really want to have your stream stick out, I definitely will ask you to consider you know being accessible for you know for our deaf audience who relies on closed captioning for them to interact for them to know what's going on to have that um, it makes it very clear I think it's very user-friendly it does not you know it doesn't hurt you there um, I know that Twitch has their own extensions for closed caps uh, captioning but I will say that the pixel chat one is a lot better it's very easy to invite very easy to break up very clean simple GUI and that is something that I love about any service if you have a really good user interface that is clear concise and it's not a hot mess you're going to have a whole lot more success. So stream elements and pixel chat, huge. Um, TikTok. <laughs> TikTok something that uh, I kind of am addicted to, kind of not. But I'm very super late to the game because I didn't understand TikTok. And when you don't understand something, sometimes that seems really f frightening. Uh, but it is really a super useful tool. I will say that definitely use Twitter. Twitter is great for networking. But TikTok is great for getting your content and getting more eyes on your content and attracting people. Like the ability, the way that TikTok's algorithm works is so interesting. And I find incredibly unique after like using it and fiddling around with it for like the last year. It is incredibly unique about how it tailors your audience to attract new people to see you. And it I, I won't say it's super easy to go viral, but the, uh, the opportunity for it to go viral is always there. 
Um, and because you have this short form standard of it, I mean, Twitch, you can kind of do that, but it gets really super cluttered. Well, TikTok is video, video only, and that's the only thing you have to focus on. It really teaches you to be able to edit in a creative manner that captivates the audience quickly and for you to be interesting. I don't think there's really, like, I can't even say that about YouTube. Like, y you do have to captivate your audience rather quickly in those first few seconds, but it's, I would say it's like a long form of, of content creation. D does YouTube have shorts on it? Yes. Is it as easily accessible as the algorithm and everything like that? No, I don't, I don't feel it is. Um, but with TikTok, you have, you have a great audience, untapped audience that, you know, you have people still like in lockdown or quarantining or at home or whatever it may be, that's looking for some form of entertainment that really can lead back to your channel back to all your social medias and really harness that um on top of that so the your algorithm is based off of what you are looking at what are you watching or spending your most time on what are you what are you clicking on who are you following so my tiktok consists of the three top things and i which i think says a lot about me i have streamers i have marketing investments and last one is cleaning <laughs> a lot of cleaning tiktoks but um i i also have have been and i've started transitioning my purpose of using tiktok um i started posting like really short clips on there um which i'm kind of amazed that even breaks like having two or three hundred viewers i think i have one that's at, like 600 something which that is small numbers considering but in the grand scheme of things 600 eyes on a video that i made that i wouldn't get on any other platform whether it be instagram or twitter um and i got that on the first day i think on twitter i usually unless it's really super super interesting um and people are going to stop and actually watch the entire video uh i think it takes me like three or four days to get that 600 views on twitter and the the other purpose i'm using tiktok is that it's really great for short form education uh to to be able to showcase what you know and this this goes this range true on on any other platform is one of the top things that you can do and create content for is things that you are very knowledgeable on um, and it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It doesn't have to be anything like super in depth, but those are usually the top things. If you are lacking ideas to create content, go with what you know. So I've been using the streamer side of TikTok to see what kind of how-to videos are people are putting out. And a lot of it, which is a benefit for me, a lot of it is regurgitated how-tos and tips, which is is awesome why do i say that is because these people are using the concept of somebody else to give the same type of information whereas somebody who's a little bit in, been in it a little bit longer know something different can create content on top of that and just be like hey here's what you here's what you should know um is there some bad tips on there yes and somehow people are following those and i'm like that's some some bad advice i will not say what they are but it gives me idea. It gives me a good list of like, okay, this is what is missing. And that is what you should think about, about all of your content, no matter where it goes, is find out what is missing within your niche and focus on that. Because that is something that is lacking and people need to hear. And when you can create that content in an educated, quick manner, that's easy to understand. Uh, that's a bonus. I'm sorry. And that's that's just for any content that is really research what it is that you can help people do or they are missing that will benefit you. So I do have some planned TikToks uh, around that to be centered that leads right back to my, you know, my channel. Uh, and again, this advice can just go for any platform for anything that you're you want to talk about that you want to be known for. 
uh, to keep track of all of these things. So something I've never had before that I, I've been doing that's actually helping me. I am the type of person that needs some type of organization. Um, and it's better when it's visual. I love journals. I always write. I always keep it. I have sticky notes like everywhere with, with places. So I've actually um, used it as not just for myself to keep myself organized, but for people um, coming to my stream, what they can look forward to. So I love Trello. I use Trello for like project managing, for uh, marketing managing, for other items, um, but never for my personal stream. And I'm not too sure why. So I started doing that. I created my Trello. So it's designed to show, you know, what games are in my backlog. Um so that people know what they can, you know, look forward to once I finish this one game. Hey, this is a list to pick from. There's a voting option in there. Um, so that if there's one game in my backlog that people want to see me play more so than the others, I'm going to check where the voting is. Like, oh, okay, this one is has more popular. I'll start this one. I have um, a list in there or cards in there for what I'm currently working on, whether it be on stream or off. That's what I'm working on. It has information and links to all of these games. Um, and I'm also going to be leaving like little short notes on it. Like, Hey, like my own personal rating system, uh, as well as games that have either been finished or completed. Um, that's all in there as a visual for, for people to check on. Um, I think that adds on a lot of engagement so people can see what they're getting into. I will eventually like, be creating my um my streaming card my schedule really and putting that in there uh so people know in advance and on top of that uh, and i'm a, a little bit more of a visual person but organized person uh i have a google docs that i don't know if i want to make that public or well known because my trello obviously does not have my full complete backlog but my google docs will eventually have my entire um, backlog but I also am very much a person about transparency um, it's important to me and I wouldn't say that it was ever brought up to me but um, I know people always criticize content creators off of products whether they bought it it was reviewed it was sponsored or whatever it may be so the only thing that my google docs has that my Trello doesn't have um, is a column that shows if I bought it or if it was a review copy or if it was sponsored. Um, I like that type of transparency so people can see like, hey, I do buy my own games. Not everything is just given to me for free um, because I think that um, adds trust within the community that you want to build so that they know that whatever you say and your opinions on it are true, no matter how that game was obtained. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth. I have a whole lot more games to add on top of that, but I, I've been using, um, GOG's galaxy, which is, uh, a platform that you can pull in and link all of your platforms, PlayStation, Xbox, EA, um, origins, uh, steam. So you can see your entire game library. And I can just say that my backlog makes me cry. And then last but not least, even though I personally, uh, I do use, and I can, I can pretty much put this out there because it is going to be some of the topics that I create my TikTok videos around. Um, I use Adobe Creative Cloud to create all of my graphics, um, that I use. I mean, I do commission some of my emotes, but majority of the videos and the graphics that I make, I I'm subscribed to Creative Cloud. I make it in there. But not everybody has that. And uh, not everybody is well aware of certain um, free options that are out there for them to use that they don't have to invest a lot of money in. Um, the big one is Canva that a lot of creators have been using, which is really great. But for somebody who like, if you if you get some of the purchases from nerd or die for overlay overlays or um, emotes they give you the psd files so that you can make those edits yourself not everybody has photoshop but there are uh, browsers that's called a photo p that you can use it's free to use it's basically built in the browser like photoshop is and you can pull in those psd files 
make edits, make those changes and save them and use them without having to subscribe to a $50 subscription fee every month or to buy Photoshop outright. Um, that not people are aware of that I feel that if you want to step up what you create on Canva, Photopea would be a really great alternative. So these are things that I've been using, that I've been learning, that I've been trying out myself so that when I give advice to people, it comes from a place of experience, not because I listen to some regurgitated how-to on TikTok <laughs> that I hope somebody uses my how-to and regurgitates that and like, it's me. So that, that's where I've been at with it. It's a little bit of a lengthier process for me to get back to, to streaming again. But, um, you know, I feel that you should never, ever jump into something haphazardly. Um, when you jump into something, you, I, my advice for anybody is to really go in there with a clear head, a plan, and organized because if you jump into something in the unknown or unsure and not ready you're floundering and you're drowning in it and you're trying to keep up um, with no clear direction you're just trying to stay afloat and I don't I don't want to get to that point again um, and of course the first step in doing that was clearing out your creative space whether it be a whole room or a section of a room just to clear that out so for you to be able to focus for you to be able to work comfortably for you to be in a good space so those are my tips no, i appreciate that that was uh fantastic uh great tips there uh, Google Docs, uh, I definitely love Trello I've seen a couple of times I haven't really uh, done much with it uh, but uh, it is a fantastic tool based on what I was able to see when I did open up an account with Trello. I think Asana is another one, too. That's pretty uh, dope. Uh, Stream Ladder, I'll, I'll check out, see what's going on there. Ooh, Stream that's Elements. what I forgot to do. I forgot to mention Stream Ladder. Go ahead. You did. So Stream Ladder is a really great tool if you it's a, for video editing. So if anybody's ever wondering how they can quickly put their clips up on um on Instagram or on Twitter or on TikTok without it having to be, um, you know, in that 16.9. You want it so that when people are seeing it, they see the full clip, but you don't have editing software. You don't want to use DaVinci or that's too much. What Streamladder does, and it, it primarily works with Twitch clips. So you take the link from your Twitch clips, you put it into Streamladder, and then what you're going to do is you're going to find that section um, that's best suited for mobile viewing that covers the most area on the, on your, on the person's phone. And you're going to select that, that section. Usually that's the center of your gaming point of view. That's where the most ha action happens. And then, um, if you have a camera, you can just like pretty much select the area where your camera is and it will automatically adjust. And you have a couple different options about, uh, where you want your camera placed on top of it. So just kind of cut it out. And then once you have that all, it will export it, transcode it, all that other stuff for you. And all you have to do is download it and you can upload it to wherever you need it to be without having to buy any editing software, without you having to go through that cut here, paste there, recenter it, make it mobile friendly. It does it for you. Yeah, that looks cool. I'm looking at the website right now, and I'm like, that could be cool when you're trying to get that dope, dope uh, clip from Twitch and and post it. And, yeah, so I'm really feeling that particular tool uh, for sure. I may have to to visit that. But uh, you did mention PhotoP and Canva. Those are fantastic. So, yeah, uh, thank you so much for all of those awesome, awesome tips and I'm opening up a uh, hand raising right now. If you're an audience and you want to come up and ask uh, a couple of questions, comments, or anything like that related to some of the things that you heard in this particular episode, episode 604, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, if there are any, if there are any comments or anything like that, um, we will begin to close out. But um, anything else that you want to mention regarding uh, what you are, your expectations for this year, especially from the content uh, creative. Uh, uh, spectrum. Um, 
I I think I have my expectations set pretty low. <laughs> I just want to be able to be do, be able to do it consistently, consistently again, and just enjoy it. This is like like I did back in 2011, which is crazy because I was um, updating some of my commands, and um, I had one set up for Twitchversary, and it told me that like oh. Started your account on June 19th, I think, 2011. I'm like, oh, man, I missed my 10 year. <laughs> wow. Okay, I should have known that one. That made me a little bit sad. But it was like, wow, this year will be 11 years on, on Twitch. Granted, I did take a hiatus, so I don't know if it really counts as a full 11. But uh, there's a lot that has changed. A lot has changed in in the world of content creators, um, whether it be gaming or not. I mean, YouTube has had some huge changes um, and it's really changed how it markets. I think all the platforms, how they market their creators and who's found success and based off of what. And I think ha has definitely, I guess I have to wait and see how that has formed our current generation in their sense of creativity I think there's a lot of people who have, how do I, how do I put this? Um, you can definitely sense the type of raising people has had based off of how much they've had to YouTube, how to do something, <laughs> which is, it's just good for the people who are creating that content because people are going to go back and, and use it, but it's also kind of really sad. Hmm. Like, yeah, I was watching this one TikTok of this girl. She was, like, teaching teaching how to change the oil. And I'm like, wait a second. People who don't know how to change their own oil? What are you doing? <laughs> I learned to change my oil when I was eight. But that was a whole different time, so I guess. So it's definitely it's definitely been a very interesting ride this last decade, even though it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, it's definitely interesting uh, times. I'm looking forward to uh, just uh, creating, creating and sharing what I've learned, what I've um, experienced, whether it's social audio or, you know, video content. Um, so I'm just excited about that particular world. I uh, definitely say definitely join the club, the Alliance Academy. Uh, if you're listening to this on a podcast, definitely go to uh, the platform, the the social audio platform, called clubhouse and definitely look for the alliance academy and follow us there uh follow daniela at miss djm on twitter uh that's miss djm on twitch um any other places daniela um yeah you can find me on instagram and on tiktok all the same names miss djm the only one that's different is youtube because somebody is holding on to my name so that's miss djm 16 Dope, dope. You can find me on Twitter at U-R-I-Y-Y-A. That's Uriah, U-R-I-Y-Y-A. And the Willow link, if you guys follow that, it is the same name, U-R-I-Y-Y-A, on most platforms, which includes uh, Instagram as well. So, yeah, so the podcast is available on all podcast platforms. And definitely join the newsletter on Substack, which is andrew alliance Dot com and guys thanks for listening we really do appreciate it and then all final thoughts final final goodbyes um yeah actually one of my expectations is definitely having fun and just you know i'm glad we're, we're back and recording hopefully we hit episode 700 this year i know i was asking for a lot that'd be crazy yeah but it'll be great um and i miss you i miss you that's it Thank you guys for listening and until next time, have a good one and be safe. Bye.